Hello, Saints. This is Dr. Terry A. Webb coming to you once again with a midweek inspiration. Lately, I've been dealing with the topic of forgiveness in my sermons and in my study, and it is something that the world really needs. We have to move past some of the things that are going on in our life and be able to fully embrace God and all of the well-being that God has for us and all the blessings that God has in mind for each of us. If we just look back at Genesis, the end of Genesis, chapter chapter 48 through the end of Genesis, Joseph had the power and the means to take out his brothers who sought to kill him before then. But yet and still, he did what was right. No one said it was easy. We don't know. But he did what was right. His brothers came to him in Egypt from a famine they were experiencing at their, at their home. And Joseph, in the midst of this, thought about his father. And he had compassion on his brothers who didn't fully recognize who he was in the beginning because they presumed that he was dead. Imagine how much better our life could be if we focused on the Heavenly Father instead of seeking to strike back at someone who may have offended us that we believe has offended us. Too many times we miss out on blessings and opportunities and times to connect with people. And oftentimes people are in our families because we're so focused on what happened that we can't see what God did in the midst of that storm. Joseph forgave his brothers. And welcomed them into his land that he caught it in. If you remember the story, he had been in some tumultuous situations, dangerous situations, but he made it out because he stayed true to the Father. If we stay true to the Father God, it is amazing what we may be able to do. And we need to understand what forgiveness is. And the question before us today is what is forgiveness? What does it look like? What isn't it? So many people struggle with forgiveness because they think they have to forget. The F in forgiveness does not mean forget. It means having faith to move on in Christ Jesus. We've heard from Jesus that it is essential for us to forgive. It is not the icing on the cake of Christianity. If we don't experience it and offer it to others, we will perish in our own sin. It says that in the Lord's Prayer. So it's tremendously important to know what this is and how essential it is to our eternal life. We can't hold on to things that are not beneficial to us. It's like holding on to a disease when you, it can be cured. And forgiveness, unforgiveness is a disease really because what it does is it festers in us. It creates depression, anxiety, and angst. It drives wedges in families. They're siblings that haven't talked to each other in years. Their spouses that live in the same house and do not communicate. They're, they're family members that because of something that happened in 1986 and it's 2021, they still have not reconciled. But these same individuals may be praying to God daily that God will bless them, that God will forgive them for their sins, but yet and still in their heart, they can't find it to forgive someone who may have presumably offended them. See, what I think is the very biblical definition of forgiveness comes from passages of scriptures. You know what? In Romans 12 and 19, we have to resist thoughts of revenge. It says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. That is, if wrong was done with God's anointed, God's going to handle it the way that he sees fit. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance is not our job. It is not our duty to go out to try to bring anybody down. Don't seek to do evil to anyone. First of Thessalonians 5 and 15. So that no one repays evil for evil. It is our duty to live a life that we treat people the way we want to be treated. Such that God can keep. We can keep God in our favor. We need to wish well on our offenders. Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you. We need to also not delight when our enemies experience travesty. I know I've seen people doing the cabbage patch, the stanky leg, the achy breaky and everything when an enemy or an ex 
has a calamity that befalls them. That is not the way of God. That is not the will of God. It says in Proverbs 24 and 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. That's for she too. We should never take delight in someone that we have a problem with losing anything. I've even seen people stoop so low that someone lost a loved one and they said they deserved it. None of us have the right to ever proclaim a statement like that, because if we all look back over our lives, there's a point in our life that God should have taken something from us, that God should have struck all of us down, that God should not even forgiven us for the sins that we have done, because most of them were done egregiously, meaning that we did them because we wanted to. So who are we to sit back on our laurels, sit in our recliner, our chair on the porch, drinking lemon aid or some form of iced tea, Long Island or not, and resonate all this joy because someone we perceive to be an enemy had a calamity. That is not of God. We need to pray for our enemies. It says in Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That doesn't mean you invite them out to dinner. That doesn't mean you have them over to your house. That means that you pray for what's best for them, that you love your enemies. You need to do this because Christ first loved you. With all of your flaws, with all of your faults, God loved you. And when possible, and I say this because we all know one or two people in our lives, that it is almost impossible to confront them and seek reconciliation no matter how peaceably we approach it. But it is our duty to seek to restore unity back to that relationship. If you have a sibling that you haven't talked to, you need to talk to them. If you have a spouse in the house you haven't talked to, you need to talk to. If you have someone, a lost friend, and you can't even identify really why you're not friends anymore, you need to seek reconciliation. We should not let our last breath be taken and we're harboring ill will towards anybody. If possible, as Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. If possible, there are some situations, saints, where the other person does not want peace. Do not place yourself in unnecessary peril. In those cases, you put yourself in necessary prayer. You get down on your knees and you ask for God's guidance and his direction and be always willing to come to their relief. You should not in a church even. It happens in churches. Well, sister such and such, I never really liked her. So now that she's struggling or she has this, I'm not going to get involved because then I'm being phony. No, you're being a Christian. If you support someone in their hour of need, it's not governed by how you feel. Feelings pass like gas and they can be distorted like a balling up a piece of paper. But our desire to be pleasing and like Christ should be our motivating factor. Exodus 23 and 4 states, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. You do not bask in the loss of someone. You do not watch something bad happen when you can do something just because you don't like this person. It goes on in churches. There are people in church who feel that they're the only one that can do anything. There are people in church, if something doesn't go their way, they have to act a fool. There are people in church who even get angry enough that they stop giving to the church as if they're punishing God, when in reality they're heaping coals upon their own damnation. There are people in church who come to church because nowhere else can they really be heard, when in reality that's not why we come to church. If you only come to church to sing because you sing, you're wrong. If you only come to church to preach because you preach, you're wrong. If you only come to church because you're a deacon to deacon, you're wrong. Usher to usher, you're wrong. Cook to cook, you're wrong. When you come into church, your eye should be on Jesus Christ. Everything else doesn't even matter. Your desire and your will to connect with our Lord and Savior is why you're there. And if you're connecting with the Father, you will find it harder and harder as time goes on to wish ill will on other people. You'll find it easy to forgive people, for many of them do not know what they do. Many of us are broken. 
That's why God is the potter and we are the clay. The clay. We are broken. And most assuredly, God can't even use us until we're broken. It is when we're at our lowest that we can look up high and see who sits up high looking down low. But when you feel someone is your enemy or when you feel, simply feel you are someone you care about has wronged you, forgiveness means resisting the temptation to take revenge. Re t forgiveness means not returning evil for evil. Forgiveness means wishing them well. Forgiveness means wishing them well even when you hear bad things about them. Forgiveness means praying for the good of them and their families. Forgiveness means seeking reconciliation. Re reconciliation. I don't know why I can't say that word. Seeking reconciliation as much as you can. And when you can, it's all right to help this person that may have offended you. Just don't put yourself in peril. And the one thing about it is, as it says in Matthew 18 and 35, we must have a forgiving heart. And our heart is important to Jesus. That's why he said, unless you forgive your brother from your heart, you won't reap the benefits that God is asking you to have in regard to forgiveness. See, forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgiveness is not about the absence of anger. It's not about feeling good or having an unrealistic expectation of an individual. Forgiveness is not the absence of consequences of sin. See, the thing of it is, what we don't understand is that David sinned and there were consequences. One example is in the book of Hebrews. On the one hand, the book teaches that all Christians are forgiven for their sins. But on the other hand, it teaches that our Heavenly Father disciplines us, sometimes severely. In Hebrews 8 and 12, it says, I will be merciful, merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. But in Hebrews 12 and 6 and 10, it says, Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son who he receives. Our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time, as seems best to them. But God disciplines us for our good, and we may, that we may share his holiness. So our sins are forgiven and forgotten in a sense. That they are no longer to bring wrath or judgment upon us. That doesn't mean that they go away. But not in the sense that they no longer bring down pain or cause the Heavenly Father to discipline us. The same is true with the people that we're forgiving who have offended us in our life. And I said, David was definitely a man after God's own heart. The man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13 and 14 committed adultery and had Uriah killed. And Nathan, the prophet, came in with stinging words to him in 2 Samuel 12 and 9. Why have you despised the words of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. David is broken by this indictment and says, I have sinned against the Lord, to which Nathan responds on behalf to God. The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. But even though God has forgiven him, his sin is taken away. Nathan says in verse 14, however, because by this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. In fact, Nathan says the consequences of the sin will be even greater. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly. But I will do, no, do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. God forgave David, but there was a cost. We need to be cognizant of the fact that we might think we're getting away with something, but we're really not. We must always be willing to forgive. And the faster we forgive, the better we forgive, the more sincere our forgiveness is to understand that the other person may not forgive us. That's not our job. Our job is to be on guard. 
to seek reconciliation and to seek to improve our position in Christ. We cannot make someone accept our apology, but we need to make every effort possible to make the apology such that no matter what we face, no matter what we're up against, no matter how it turns out, we have a forgiving heart. But even, even when the person refuses, and absolutely, some of you know what I'm talking about, because you are that person that cannot be wrong, will not accept that you are wrong, have never done wrong in your own eyes. Some of us are so low that we read our own press clippings. But even, even, I say even, when this person will not accept the responsibility for what they have done to you. We're commanded to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us and do good to those who hate us. It is written in God's word in Luke 6.27. See, the difference is when a person who has wronged us does not repent with contrition and confession and conversion, that is turning from sin to righteousness, he cuts off the full work of forgiveness. We can still lay down our ill will. We can hand over our anger to God. We can seek to do that individual good, but we cannot carry through reconciliation with someone who is not willing to sit down and talk. See, what we have to do here is we have to do our best for God. We're not doing this for the other person because when we forgive other people, we're lightening the load on ourselves. We're creating a space in us that the continuing growth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be exhibited in our lives. No one said that it's going to be easy. No one said that it was going to be rainbows, unicorns, and pop tunes. <laughs> but it is our duty. It is our opportunity to advance our position in Christ when we forgive those who will not forgive us and we work with those who will reconcile us because our goal as Christians <laughs> is to, by example, convert other people over to the way and the will and to walk in the marvelous light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, forgiveness is for us. Uh, it's not for the other person. Forgiveness restores us uh, to the position that we need to be in our Lord and Savior. So whatever you do, uh, however you word it, uh, wherever you go, uh, the things that you need to do, uh, you need to make it a point uh, that no matter the situation, uh, no matter how the person in front of you is, no matter how unknowing the person is in front of you, you need to know, you got to know, you must know who your father is in Christ Jesus, that just like we Say, are uh, the benefits of Jesus laying it all out on Calvary so that we will have access to the throne of grace. All of that work has been done. There's no need to add or to take anything from it, but we need to walk in the light, the marvelous light of Christ and let forgiveness reign in our heart. No, it won't be easy, but we have a God who is able. We have a God that cannot fail. We have a God that can part a Red Sea, that can bring dead back to life, that can restore sight to the blind. We have a God who can work with a man to do things that that man has never done. We have a God that can empower anybody to do anything at any time that walks in the will and the way of him. So Saint of God. Don't believe that you can't forgive. I entice you now. I entreat you now, wherever you are. If you can, if you can, will you get on your knees? Raise your hands up because it's hard to shout wrong if your hands are raised towards God and think about that person that you need to forgive, that situation that you need to forgive, that auntie, that uncle, that cousin, that sibling, that neighbor that you need 
need to forgive and reach down into your heart and say, God, help me to forgive this person. God, help me to lead a life that is righteous. Say, God, I've got to lift this burden off my shoulders of holding on to this rock and this weight that is wearing me down of unforgiveness. Lift it from you. Let God take that weight off of you. Oh, let God take that weight off of you of unforgiveness. Stop wanting the worst for them. Raise your hands up wherever you are and say, God, help me. I got to get this off me. I got to let go of this resentment. I've got to let go of this bitterness. I've got to let go of this tendency to want revenge. I've got to let go of my sarcasm. I've got to embrace my way of Christ. I've got to practice love. I've got to be what you call me to be. Change my heart. Make it white as snow. Change my attitude. Change my perceptions. Change everything about me. Let me go away so you can manifest your presence. Saints, we can forgive. And you too can learn to walk in the light. The beautiful light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You no longer have to be downtrodden and heavy laden by what happened because the hand of God is actively on you, seeking to mold you and shape you in the way that you should go. Let God have his way with you and be willing to engage Christ in every decision. Be willing to let your faith be active. Be willing to let your faith work and be willing to never compromise your position in Christ because the world says you should be angry. The world says you should get strike back. The world says you should get even. No, God is saying vengeance is his and it is our duty and it is your task and your obligation and your command because God said vengeance is mine. Saints of God, learn forgiveness and let God have his way with you as we go about leading our lives knowing that God is able, never give up. Give me a word of prayer. But special Heavenly Father, we come before you today, ask you to God to bless all those who are under the sound of my voice today, that you give them the solace that they need, that you give them the tranquility that they need, and you give them the strength. Gird them up, dear God, in a manner such that they can let go of this weight of unforgiveness, such that they may be able to reconcile everything that they can reconcile, that they learn to pray for those who despitefully use them, that they let nothing in this world stop them and break their connection to you, that they allow you in their lives to be first and foremost, that they allow you to manifest your presence in them, knowing that if they continue in your will and your way, that eventually they'll be able to walk on with their head high, knowing that this event that transpired does not define them, but it is only faith that refines them. We pray this in all things in the mighty and marvelous and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Go out and tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord.